Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Climate Career Portal launch. The traditional land on which Iron and Earth is located is on Treaty 6 territory. We would like to thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Nehi Yao, the Denye, the Anishinaabe, the Nakota Iska, and the Nisitapi peoples. We also acknowledge this as Métis homeland and the home of one of the largest communities of Inuit south of the 60th parallel. My name is Luisa De Silva, and I am the executive director here at Iron and Earth. Iron and Earth is a worker-led nonprofit with a mission to empower fossil fuel industry and indigenous workers to build and implement climate solutions. We were built by workers for workers to support the energy transition that Canada needs. At Iron and Earth, we've heard from fossil fuel workers time and time again through polling, focus groups, and one-on-one -on -one interviews that energy workers are interested in switching to net zero jobs. Some are motivated by concerns about climate, others by a need for job stability. But what we've heard across the board from workers is that they need more support for job training, mentorship, and a better understanding of the transferability of their skills to navigate switching to net zero. This is why Iron and Earth created the Climate Career Portal. The Climate Career Portal is an online, first of its kind, one-stop career transition tool made by Canadians for Canadians. The Climate Career Portal shows workers how their skills apply to a wide range of careers in climate solutions across rapidly growing industries like wind, solar, energy efficiency, and directly connects them to job openings and training. Now let's watch a quick video. The agenda for this afternoon will be an opening speech by Minister Regan, a demonstration of the Climate Career Portal from the Portal co-founders, a panel discussion of the transition to net zero, an open question period, and closing remarks. For the open question period, questions will be collected in the chat throughout the event, and please feel free to add your questions in the chat. So it is now my honor to introduce Minister Seamus O'Regan, Jr. Minister O'Regan is the MP for St. John South Mount Pearl, elected in 2015, and in 2021, he was appointed Canada's Minister of Labour, having served in the roles of Minister of Natural Resources, Minister of Indigenous Services, and Minister of Veterans Affairs, and Associate Minister of National Defence. As part of his mandate as Minister of Labour, he is tasked with leading a comprehensive plan to lower emissions and create more sustainable jobs for Canada's workers. Thank you, Minister, for being here today. Thanks a lot, Louisa. And I'm speaking to you from Calgary, traditional territory of the Treaty Seven Nations in Southern Alberta and the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region Three. Uh, and being a Newfoundlander in Alberta, you feel right at home. This is a, a daily migration that occurs uh, and has occurred now for decades. Um, so I'm very happy to be in Calgary. Last week I was in Edmonton and please God, I'll be back again next week. Um, 
so yeah, as Louisa said, uh, I'm the Minister of Labor now. I was the Minister of Natural Resources for pre the previous two years. And, uh, and I'd often be speaking to the Prime Minister about our goals for a net zero economy and, um, and how we had to reframe this in terms of when we talked about oil and gas workers, that it wasn't a matter of just, transi just transitions or helping people through a transition. It is a matter of workers leading this. Um, you know, everybody knows that the labor force in, in Alberta and Saskatchewan relies heavily on, on the oil and gas sector. Uh, it's even more true uh, in my home province, Newfoundland and Labrador. We actually, our, our provincial government and our provincial economy relies more on oil and gas than Alberta. Uh, you know, and, and that's my home. I got skin in the game. Uh, it's it's uh, oil and gas workers make up a big part of my constituency. So I'm driven to get this right. These are my neighbors, my friends, uh, my family. Um, so, you know, I talked with the prime minister about this sort of thing, and uh, I guess I made a fairly impassioned case on several occasions because now I am the minister of labor. And along with Jonathan Wilkinson, my friend, who is now uh, has succeeded me as minister of natural resources, we're working together on, you know, what has historically been called uh, the just transition uh, to a low carbon economy. It's not a term I like. Uh, it's not a term I like because most of my constituents don't like it. It's scary, it induces anxiety. I have suffered anxiety in my life and uh, hate it, and I don't want to incite it with anybody else. Um, but you know, when I say it, you know what I mean. Um, uh, Jonathan and I went through an incredibly long branding exercise of, I think, a couple of conversations and a joke, and, and we landed on sustainable jobs um, as just an alternative. Um, because we need to find, we need to make sure that the opportunities that come from a net zero economy are sustainable, that those jobs are sustainable, that the jobs pay well, that they have pensions, um, that more often than not they could be their union jobs, uh, their jobs that last, and they're not subject to the you know normal kind of boom and bust cycle. Um, I remember talking to the head of the union of operating engineers, the crane operators, uh, you know, at the beginning of my tenure at, uh, with natural resources, and he said to me, you know, I don't care if I'm lifting a pipeline for guys who are lifting a pipeline or a wind turbine works work. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about lowering emissions and building up renewables. The work is largely the same. The people that we need for the job are largely the same. The expertise required is the same. This is complex stuff. And I got to tell you, it actually irritates the heck out of me when I hear people or I get millions of tweets, it seems, in any given day just saying, we want the just transition now. This is not magic wand stuff. This is complex engineering and hard work that requires skilled people. Uh, we need to create those opportunities to make sure that we don't lose people from the industry. We need people in this industry. Uh, we need to create those jobs with competitive pay and competitive benefits and competitive pensions. And, and it is the men and women who currently work on our oil and gas sector, they are the ones who will lead this. Like I said, who else is gonna do the work? Who the heck is gonna do the hard work? The hard work, of lowering emissions and building up renewables. You know, I don't know what to do with a wind turbine. Uh, I don't know what angle to put a solar panel at. I don't know anything about lowering methane levels uh, or building up a hydrogen infrastructure. But can Canadian building trades and our operating engineers and our iron workers, this crowd know what they're doing and we need them. Uh, not just at the table when we make these investments, we need them at the helm and driving this. You know, I say it was about a generation, maybe generation and a half ago, we asked these workers to figure out a way to get oil out of sand, and they did. And Canada is now the fourth largest producer of oil and gas on earth, and that is incredible. And I look at the offshore, uh, I wrote speeches around the time of the Hibernia platform's first oil. I was writing speeches for the premier today, Brian Tobin. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. We knew how to fish. We didn't know much about oil. And it was just the other week I was sitting next to uh, Owen, another young guy in his early 30s, uh, on his way to Mozambique to show him how it's done. The president of ExxonMobil Canada told me that obviously ExxonMobil operating everywhere in the world, there is no harsher environment that they operate in than the Newfoundland offshore. And yet here we are, we're doing it. So it's the people who with the ingenuity 
and the work ethic and the creativity that have done this for our country, now we need them urgently to pivot, to lower emissions and to build up renewables. That's what we got to do. It's a big task. Um, we have to take the industry that we built and the product that we produce here, and we got to figure out how to lower the emissions. Um, because there's no question the planet's burning. Farmable land is shrinking. Droughts are growing longer. Floods are getting worse, particularly out here in the West. Forest fires choking our skies. We got to do it urgently. It is workers who are going to lower emissions and build up renewables, and they are going to make a more prosperous place for our workers and for investment in this country. They will lead, and we will get the affordable renewable energy alternatives we need. And we will have a prosperous economy with what we know how to do, oil and gas, with considerably lower emissions. We need to use all the tools we got. We need everyone at the table. It's the only way we're going to get to a prosperous net zero economy. It's the only way we are going to take the fourth, you know, Canada is the fourth largest producer of oil and gas and show the world how it's done. So this is a problem and an opportunity for our country, for our communities. Um, but it is also something that as we go through, we can't leave anyone behind. Oil and gas workers will not be left behind and energy workers will not be left behind. And provinces like mine, provinces like this one in Alberta and Saskatchewan will not be left behind. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I turn it on its head. We will lead, we will lead. So this new, old, new tool from Iron and Earth, look, I think it's gonna help take some of that anxiety away from workers who worry about words like just and transition. It will help create sustainable jobs in an effort to grow our economy, to build new opportunities, new investment. Um, but it is energy workers uh, that are going to lead. And I, you know, Iron and Earth's career portal, I think it's just gonna shine a light on that. It's gonna help workers see the opportunity that's out there. So, you know, I'll, I'll finish by saying that no one in our economy makes it on their own. There's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. I think Canada succeeds when we all work together, when industry and unions, workers, experts, governments, stakeholders, indigenous communities, which I, which I think there will be huge opportunities. When we all work together to build and seize those opportunities that we can all share in. Um, that is what creating a sustainable economy is all about. All of us working together, using all of the tools at our disposal that make no mistake, it is Canada's energy workers that will lead. So uh, thank you so much, Louisa. I'm gonna pack, pass back to you now. I just wanna thank you. Uh, Iron and Earth has inspired me and inspired, uh, I know Jonathan and Stephen Gibo, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Um, I, uh, during my time as Minister of Natural Resources, very early meeting with your organization inspired me throughout my tenure and still does. And in that spirit, you know, I've got a flight to catch fairly soon to go back to Ottawa here from Calgary, but I'm going to stay here and just listen to what's going on for as long as I possibly can. So again, thank you all very much. It's uh, you're an inspiration to me. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Minister Regan. We're really so glad that you could come here today. Next, I'd like to introduce the two co-founders of the Climate Career Portal, Sally Lynn and Rohan Nutel. These two have been the driving force behind the creation and expansion of the Climate Career Portal. Rohan has always been passionate about sustainability. Growing up in Edmonton, he established several youth initiatives advocating for greater environmental stewardship from high school recycling programs to K-12 curriculum reform. Now he is channeling his interest in programming, data science, and program-based solutions to help bring Iron and Earth's Climate Career Portal to life. He's currently studying for his MSc in Computer Science, and Rohan holds a BSc in Physics and is a former Urban Climate Data Scientist. Sally has strong roots in community engagement and capacity building initiatives. She is a skilled graphic designer, dialogue facilitator, and project coordinator. With experience ranging from nonprofits to the United Nations, she is passionate about human well being and sustainability, an issue that connects her deeply to the mission of Iron and Earth. She earns her BA in political science and human geography from the University of British Columbia and is also working with UNESCO to advance futures literacy. Sally and Rohan will now demonstrate the Climate Career Portal and show you what's to come. Thanks, Louisa. Hi, Thanks, everyone. Louisa. Thanks for being here. 
We're really looking forward to showing you the platform. Cool. Thanks, Lisa. Let's, and great to have everyone here. Let's, uh, let's dive into it. So where, like, where did the Climate Career Portal come from? Um, so it started by just looking at three primary gaps that uh, we were aware of. Like the, the major obvious one is a lack of centralized information about climate careers in Canada, um, and even less information about how someone who's working in fossil fuels and oil and gas can navigate away from that if they wish and into new opportunities in, in climate solutions. And so the lack of a platform made specifically for climate and green careers, especially targeted towards trades and skilled workers, uh, means that they're not able to connect up directly with potential hiring companies uh, due to existing job boards primarily targeted uh, for white collar workers. Uh, of course, the exception of some like Indeed and LinkedIn, um, but those are mostly job boards and they don't show how climate jobs uh, match up with oil and gas careers and they're not full uh, transition platforms. We also needed uh, more visibility for, for trades and worker training programs of all sorts of formats from short-term hands-on training uh, to courses that are online, uh, maybe build towards a college diploma. Uh, and we also wanted to showcase companies and organizations in climate that are looking to hire, hire workers. So our response to this was to build a scalable digital solution that's unique to Canada and also responsive to the demand and interests from, from workers. And it's something we hope to continue developing uh, over, over the months and years ahead listening to feedback from, from you. So moving on to the next slide and thinking about what some of the workers uh, that we spoke to are saying uh, and how we've addressed their asks. The first thing was that there are many different transition pathway, pathways, uh, but the fastest one is to, is to show how existing worker skills are already being needed in climate. Just pointing out you know, how a welder or a boilerplate maker is actually needed right now in wind. Or, or geothermal, um, but that, that information was kind of hard to find and didn't, doesn't, doesn't really exist. So we use data from the Canadian US government to generate brand new research that mapped out the skills from fossil fuel occupations, the skills they currently have, but also what kinds of skills seem to be commonly needed by climate solutions uh, in, in the net zero economy. And we started off with wind, solar, geothermal, electric vehicle charging, energy efficiency, and energy storage as the first five solutions that, that we looked at. And so when you visit the site, you're gonna be able to read all about these climate solutions and see how different kinds of oil and gas occupations match up. And there's gonna be lots more to come on that front. We also curated information on over 40 different training programs, pulled contextual information about which climate solutions they map onto best, we figured out which ones were online, which ones were hands-on. We figured out their costs. We figured out what kinds of credentials they offer um, and ones that can help, help you work towards apprenticeships or becoming a journey person. So you have all that information in one place available to you without any ambiguity. And then we also figured out that it was important to showcase where opportunity is actually right now. Where are the projects being built? Where are the wind turbines going? Where are the solar panels going? So we've been listing energy projects that are over 10 megawatts in capacity from all over Canada to help you discover where they are and, and, and which companies are developing them. And we plan to continue developing and expanding that list over time. And finally, we've also been posting, we have a jobs uh, platform which, which pulls information uh, from these companies, we, you know, we're keeping that, uh, we're hard at work keeping, keeping that job board up to date the best we can. Um, and yeah, so I'll let, I'll hand it over to, to Sally to, to give a, a deeper walkthrough in, into what we built. Thanks, Rohan. Um, so why don't we take a look at some, how someone might actually use the Climate Career Portal, specifically Jacob. Um, Jacob really embodies the questions that a lot of workers are asking uh, Iron and Earth and generally have in mind. And so Jacob's about 36 years old, mid-career, 
located in Ontario. Uh, he's been an industrial electrician for all of his work, um, and he desires more job stability, wants to be closer to family in Ontario, but is also concerned about climate change. Um, he's very new to the transition space and is mainly curious uh, about what working on solar projects would be like. Um, and he's not sure where to start, but he is curious. So if we look at Jacob using the portal, when Jacob comes onto the portal, he's going to search for his current occupation. And so that's industrial electrician. Um, the portal then will show him that his skills as an industrial electrician are actually needed in four different climate solutions. And so that's the results that it returns, um, which is pretty neat for a worker to immediately see, okay, my skills are needed in these areas. Um, now, Jacob is especially interested in solar, which happens to be one of the four shown. So he's gonna go and click on the drop down, uh, and that directly shows him uh, which exact skills match over, it gives a little bit of a description and actually the employment outlook um, by 2030 as well. Uh, and there are buttons leading him to projects, jobs, training and details. So Jacob wants to get a sense of what's going on in solar. So he kicks on projects. And the nice thing is that the projects page has been pre-filtered to solar projects. So he doesn't need to click around more or look twice. Uh, and can directly see the major energy projects around Canada in solar. And if you were to go back to search results, Jacob can also click on jobs, which brings him to the jobs board. Uh, and this jobs board is also pre-filtered to solar. So from the search results, um, wherever folks click out, it's gonna be pre-filtered to that climate solution that they're looking at. Um, and he sees something that he might be interested in, which is a wind technician. So he goes uh, and tries to save it with the bookmark. And he's taken to a sign up page. Uh, by signing up, we can save any interesting projects, jobs, or trainings that we see. Uh, and it's saved as a specially curated list uh, later on in your account. So here we see the jobs that Jacob has saved. Jacob can go back anytime to apply to them before the company deadlines. He can also very easily share the link uh, to any friends or colleagues who are also looking to transition or interested uh, in switching their careers. In addition to saving the jobs, Jacob, as before, can say training and projects as well. Um, and here we can see that Jacob's actually saved a few training programs and he was able to find offerings that are very focused on practical hands-on solar installations. So he could get some relevant experience uh, before applying to the wind technician role if he um, potentially to better position himself to have that hands-on experience. So this is just a pretty quick walkthrough of the site um, and there's definitely plenty more to explore. Uh, and so we'll definitely have a chance after today's launch to take a further look at it. Um, but we also believe that there's a lot more that Iron Earth and all of us can do. So what is next? Um, let's take a look at some of the still unresolved questions that we have workers and what we would like to do to address them. And there are six big ideas. So you'll notice that we started with six climate solutions based on just whichever ones were the uh, currently sort of fastest growing industries and the ones in energy, um, moving from uh, conventional fossil fuel energy to renewable energy. Um, but we also want to add more climate solutions such as hydrogen, nature-based solutions. Um, and that really means more transition pathways for workers being able to show them that. And currently workers are able to see how their skills are needed in climate solutions. Um, but we actually want to take it a step further to show how they can transition into specific careers by having customized climate career blueprints. Um, and since the basis about, of the platform is about skills, um, in the future, it, it would be what we would see is that workers are inputting um, information about the skills that they have, and we have information on the skills outcomes of training programs. And so if there happens to be a uh, set climate solution that needs X type of skill, 
and worker matches say like up to 80% for that particular climate solution, then they might be able to see which courses offer um, skills that meets the gap that they're looking for and they are able to better uh, customize how they actually want to transition. We also definitely want to add more visualizations to a lot of the existing information to make it more engaging for workers, um, for us to look at it, just because it's a lot of information to digest and we want to make sure that it's easy, uh, easily understood and accessible. Um, we also wish to curate a financial aid and grants inventory in response to a lot of the asks that we're receiving around um, having more resources when it comes to upskilling and rescaling. And we also know that transition pathways for different communities are very diverse. We know from our initial design survey that um, career transition decisions for Indigenous folks look really different. Um, they face different barriers, but at the same time, they might have access to different support systems. Uh, and sometimes it could be even their first um, entry point into an energy role. So we want to make sure we're expanding resources for Indigenous workers and Indigenous-led projects. Last but most certainly not least, we want to strengthen our partnership with training providers, companies, nonprofits, and institutions um, so we can give our workers as much support and information as possible. And we also understand that the transition pathway can feel um, lonely or solitary at times, and connecting with people makes a big difference. So we're looking to develop a mentorship program as well uh, and building a community for people who are transitioning into climate. And so the Climate Career Portal is really about offering transition journeys. Um, but the process of building it is definitely no small feat. Uh, we heard Minister Oregon mention this too. The transition is a major challenge and there's really no better way to do it than together. So this is a journey that we can take together with workers, with companies, with training providers, with nonprofits. So we really want to invite everyone to work with us. All of your feedback, your collaboration is very much wanted. If you're a worker, we want to talk with you to understand what you need and how we can get that on the site. If you're an industry partner or offering training programs, we want to showcase your work and offerings on the Climate Career Portals so the workers can see what you have. Um, again, this is an iterative journey uh, and one that's growing. Our hope is that the Climate Career Portal can serve as a central gathering place for a, a variety of communities, organizations, climate solutions, and to be that one-stop shop for people's net zero career transitions. Thanks. Thank you, Sally and Rohan. So the portal is now live and ready for you to be empowered to transition to a net zero career. So next, we're going to be hosting a panel discussion led by Emmanuel da Costa. Emmanuel is an Ontario-based trainer, career coach, life coach, public speaking coach, with over 20 years experience working with trades-focused youth and young adults. His focus has been to help smart, busy individuals find and develop their dream careers and live the lives they imagined. Emmanuel believes that while education teaches us what to think, it is learning how to think that allows us to change the way we react to dynamic world of work. His goal is to help workers approach their futures with the kind of optimism that comes from understanding of the transferability of both their hard and soft skills. I'll pass it over to you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Louisa. My goodness, I'm excited. This looks like an incredible program. So hello, everyone. Um, so we're going to get started um, by asking you a couple of questions. Um, first, so you'll see a pop up on the bottom of your screen. Um, and those questions will be, if you'll be so kind, just simply select the one that applies to you. Uh, you'll see it now. It says, you know, what type of user are you? Um, so please respond accordingly, and we'll take the poll results up in a few moments. There's a bit of a timer that lets you know when, uh, when we're done. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. You're all responding. This is fantastic. Lovely. Okay, I think we're all, we've all responded. Perfect. Perfect. So um, thank you very, very much. Um, the, oh, the results are in. And can we see them? OK, 
Okay, and here we are. Wonderful. So thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. We really, really appreciate that. Um, now, if I may, I'm going to ask another question, and that poll is up right now. So um, again, what do you consider the biggest barrier to workers in transition to the net zero economy? And there is your question. Uh, please, again, answer those questions. We'll really appreciate it. It gives us a really good sense of um, who we've got here and your perspectives. Oh, look at this, this is amazing. And, okay, result time and Let's um let's see those results. And here we are. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you all so very much for um for participating in our poll. Um, this really does give us a good sense of um of where we are. And again, as as you um as you go through this process with us. Please submit your question for Q&A in the chat. You'll see the actual request for Q&A. And uh, let's continue now with this conversation. So again, I have to thank you for your kindness and for participating in our survey. Now, for this purpose, um, here we are. For this purpose, we brought together a panel um, to talk a little bit about the energy transition and what it means um, to make it just for workers. So the Climate Career Portal is a great tool, um, but Ion on Earth has been clear that this is one tool in the toolbox for a just transition. So we want to talk about how the portal fits into the broader conversation about the needs for an energy transition and how we can follow the leadership of indigenous communities leading the work on climate change the future of work, um, what is going to take to be take meaningful um, support for, for workers and to get to net zero, okay? Now, to that end, let me just close this, thank you. To that end, to start this important conversation, um, we have an amazing panel of wide range of expertise to give you their insight. First, let me have the pleasure of introducing you all to Tamara Krachenko. Tamara is an assistant professor of public administration at the University of Victoria and a member of the UVic Institute of Integrated Energy Systems. She's an expert in comparative public policy and regional development and studies just transition around the world. She has conducted comparative public policy research in over a dozen countries and has authored over 15 articles, books, and reports. Welcome, Tamara. Um, so that was Dr. Kuchenko. Um, Paul de Groot is a member of the electrician, sorry, is a master electrician with 10 years of electrical experience. He spent four years uh, in the electrical union working on large industrial oil and gas projects until he realized he wasn't feeling fulfilled with the work he was doing. So he decided to leave that um, and transition his career with his sights on finding jobs in renewable energy. For the last two and a half years, he's been working with Kirby Renewable Energies and worked his way up to being residential project manager. Welcome. Mr. De Groot. Thank you. Not at all. Now, Desmond Bull is currently elected chief of the um, Louis Bull tribe in Mawachi's nation. It treated six territory in Alberta and was elected councillor from 2012 to 2021. 
As a First Nation member elected official and an environmental steward, Desmond successfully spearheaded the installation of solar panel projects on eight public uh, buildings in his communities in 2018. These projects were installed by trained band members, 100% owned by the tribe. Devons had brought his expertise to many boards and continues to his work um, for his community, First Nations and the environment. A vision for Desmond is to create partnership with long, sorry, with local communities, large scale electrical systems and provide all electrical needs for his tribes and surrounding communities. Okay. Letitia Miller, I'd like to get, introduce you guys last but most definitively not least, is president of Nine Iron ESG Consulting, uh, where she supports industrial construction firms in developing sustainable strategies and navigating the transition of an energy landscape. She cut her teeth working on construction in the oil fields of Northern Alberta and is a champion for sustainable and heavy industry. Now, through her work and founding team member, for, sorry, through her work and founding team as a founding team member of Novus Earth, a startup addressing um, energy sovereignty and food security through advanced geothermal technology, um, Leticia sees firsthand the opportunities for transferable skills in the, in, in the emerging industries of renewables and alternative, alternative energies and technologies and the need to lead decarbonization. This is our panel. Welcome them, please. Thanks for having us. Our absolute pleasure. Now, um, I've got a couple of questions that I want to sort of bring out to you all. So first, let me ask Desmond, Paul, and Tamara, if I may. Um, what do you see as the largest overarching barrier towards achieving a just transition? Let's start with Desmond. Well, for me, um, I would look at it from my perspective as a First Nation and Indigenous person of this country. Um, uh, by, my, by myself being an Indigenous to the country, there, we face a lot of barriers, a lot of oppression in regards to making sure that we're part of any kind of economic or any type of industry that's being created. <clears throat> you know, I'm hoping that uh, as this uh, renewable and green uh, sector is going to be created, I'm hoping uh, First Nations will actually step in and get more involved. Um, there are instances uh, many times over where uh, First Nation communities, Indigenous people, have um, not been a part of uh, industry growth, whether it be forestry, whether it be oil and gas, whether it be uh, any type of sector that's being created. So, um, you know, I, um, when I first started working within the sector, I felt it was very important that uh, I get First Nations people involved in regards to any aspect of encouraging them and, and notifying that there is a connection, ancestral practice connection between renewable sectors and energy of uh, First Nations people utilizing mother nature, utilizing the sun, utilizing water, earth, uh, everything in regards to uh, sustainable living. So um, that connection is there and the, uh, the elders do understand it. Um, but for me, I think one of the, the, the barriers uh, is more or less that communication, I guess uh, that was brought up earlier. You know, I think if we wanna all do this together, there has to be a form of communication, a proper um, understanding of a consultation between First Nation communities. Because definitely we wanna get involved. We want our people to be involved in the sector. We wanna be a part of the growth and in the industry of this growth. Uh, so much so, you know, we had participated already with a previous Iron and Earth project. Uh, we're gonna be participating again with this uh, other uh, Iron and Earth project, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but the unique thing what we're doing with these projects is we're uh, putting a uh, cultural components in there, which inclu includes uh, cultural teaching, cultural ceremonies, a historical understanding of the area and the people. Um, you know, this goes so much further in regards to what we want to expect in, in regards to uh, getting First Nations involvement. Um, but for me as a First Nations, I think um, that biggest barrier is that communications and how can we do consultation proper with First Nations people in order to get large scale projects going forward? Because uh, at the end of the day, you know, these large scale projects that they do happen within the communities or within the province, they need to sit down with First Nations leaders and First Nation communities to make sure that these projects are fair and just in regards to understanding and respect to the treaty, especially in regards to reclamation or mediation. Thank you. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so very much. Uh, Paul, did you want to add anything to um, what is the largest overarching barrier towards achieving it's just transition. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you first for introducing me and thank you guys for having me today. Um, it's an honor to be here. I guess I can just speak from my experience transitioning from an oil and gas sector to renewables. Um, and Rohan and Sally kind of touched on it and gave me a little bit more information. 
But uh, I find that the barrier is the lack of information. So for, from my experience, there wasn't much information available for me when I decided to make this transition. And I was very fe fearful for the longevity of my career, leaving a, an opportunity that, that paid well. And there was you know, a lot of opportunity for growth in the oil and gas sector. Um, and there just wasn't this, this platform or this portal that I've uh, got to see today. And so I just feel like we're, we're moving in the right direction. And as Desmond uh, touched on, that the communication is everything. And to bring us all together to communicate and share, um, it's just, I'm so happy to be a, a part of this. And I hope that the lack of information just changes and that we grow towards transitioning to a just transition. Fantastic. Thank you so very, very much. And, and finally, but definitely not least, sure. Tamara. I'll chime in on that. Isn't it interesting that while there are large technical challenges to decarbonization of our economies, you're focusing, I mean, um, uh, Mr. De Groot and, and Chief Desmond both focus on the social and cultural and communications elements. And that speaks to this transition. And I'm just going to say, I echo that. So I study just transitions and intentions to decarbonize in different advanced economies around the world. And we know that these are socio-technical transitions. We know that there are technological aspects to these transition, yet it is so often the social side, the cultural side that is um, so important to focus on. And importantly, what are we transitioning to? How do we understand that economy and society? How do we have a vision of that? And how do we articulate that so that we can make the right and strategic investments. And what really strikes me studying certain other places is that you'll speak to people across industry, across government, um, workers and so on, unions, and they have this common vision of what they're trying to achieve and it's very well articulated. And they say, we see a sustainable economy or you know, it might be wind energy if you're talking about Denmark as the future of our economy. We know what we're transitioning to. We have comparative and competitive advantage. We are going to be the best at it, and we're going to sell this to the rest of the world and drive our economy and have a just transition. And like that communications element, that common vision about what we're transitioning to, it's so important to champion that and to host those conversations because then we know what we need to do and, and we can get all of our actors on board. And I just want to thank um, this initiative for being such an important part of that. And uh, it's great what you're pulling off with this portal. So congrats. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Now, um, our luck just got a little bit better. As amazing as this panel is, it just got a touch more interesting because mm -hmm. we now have with us um, Keegan Lee, um, who is a board member of Iron and Earth and is a seasoned financial professional specializing in Abor Aboriginal and project finance. Now, um, his work has had him travel to support developing countries and indigenous groups, economies through building of sustainable communities and renewable energy project. He's currently consulting nations in Cambodia, Samoa, and here in Canada on the energy transition. He's a founder of the Turtle Island Foundation, a nonprofit focused on economic reconciliation and the betterment of indigenous citizens throughout Canada and the world. He's a member of the Natakawane uh, First Nation in Northwestern Ontario. So Keegan, thank you very much. Glad you were able to join us. Uju, uh, Ani, my apologies for the delay, a little bit of a calendar snafu there, but uh, I'm here and I'm proud to be part of this panel. Thank you. We are delighted to have you here. So better late than not at all. Exactly. So thanks for joining us. Um, now, the, the next question that I have, and I promise I will get to you soon enough, Keegan. The next question that I have, I want to ask for uh, Leticia and Paul, and that is a just transition approach is focused on people. What's the single most significant policy discussion, sorry, policy decision that would make a career transition easier for the fossil fuel worker? Uh, let's start with Leticia first then. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, in my opinion, policy decisions which impact stability and assurance are, are those which will have the greatest impact on an individual's decision to make that career transition. 
Uh, I spent 20 years working in industrial construction, and one of the greatest challenges that we had as fossil fuel workers was being at the mercy of the market and riding that roller coaster of boom and bust. So what we don't want is to switch to a policy-driven roller coaster where climate solution focused policy is on again, off again. So stable policy decisions that lead to, are what lead to sustainable jobs. Uh, regulatory policy that is action oriented, long term and consistent is key. And our people based policy needs to be responsive and flexible, as we've all seen through the pandemic, in addition to the transition to a low carbon economy, our work environment has been compoundly impacted by the work from home movement and a greater demand for flexibility. Uh, so I would say maintenance, um, maintenance and consistency is key. And that's what will help assure people as they, they make that giant decision to move industries. Wonderful, wonderful. And Paul. Yeah, thanks for that, Leticia. Um, I don't know if I can add too, too much to that. You kind of hit the nail on the head there. Um, any policy that would incentivize education, uh, again, speaking from my experience, there just wasn't really anything out there. And uh, seeing this climate career portal is just uh, music to my ears. I'm trying to hire a lot of uh, staff for this coming season and going forward as our company grows. And I just think that this uh, climate career portal is just such a great platform for education where I didn't have it four or five years ago. So thank you all of you guys for this. Wonderful. Now, I think I got so excited, Keegan, by seeing you coming into the room that I forgot to ask the, the rest of the panel, does anybody else want to have anything that they want to add to either the first question or the second question? Um, please, by all means, we'd love to hear from you. Anyone else? I'll repeat, I'll repeat the first question in the event that anybody wants to. What do you see as the largest overarching barrier towards achieving the just transition? If anybody else wants to add any comments. Okay, seeing none, or do I have one? Just chime in, unmute yourself and chime in. I, I can add one, maybe one thing related to what Leticia just mentioned about regulatory certainty. Yes, please. Is that um, it's very interesting in other countries, for instance, in Denmark, their climate law has pan-party support for oil and gas phase-outs. So any, you know, industry knows what's happening. It's a very, very clear si signal. Every, ma every major party has signed on, and, and that's very helpful for them to determine what the next steps are. So um, that's part of that regulatory certainty process. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in terms of the next question, this is going to be Keegan. This, now you're on. Keegan, Leticia, and Desmond. Uh, the next question then is this. How can we best support Indigenous workers and communities in their energy transition and follow the leadership of Indigenous-led climate solutions? Uh, let's start with you, Keegan. Great, thank you. Uh, well, I, I, I think there's a couple different parts of this. Uh, the biggest thing is, to me is inclusion. Uh, we really need to, to be recognized as and I'll emphasize capable uh, entities being not only just individuals to champion projects, but the communities need to be engaged throughout the whole process. Uh, and I mean, we see this a lot. I've seen this for a very long time. I saw this in Ontario when they were doing the FIT program 15 some years ago, that was a massive failure. And you're starting to see that out West. You're starting to see that in Alberta. Alberta is doing some things right, but at the same time, they're not following through. And from what I'm seeing, you're seeing indigenous groups being invited to the table, but not respected. They, I, I've, I've heard conversations of, of communities going, being invited and being able to package and, fu and fund projects. And then just like Ontario did say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't think you'd actually be able to do that. And that, that's just disrespectful. And we really need to see both government and the industry uh, take us seriously. I mean, we're managing to do it through a lot of adversity and we, we've come a long way in the last 15, 20 years. Um, so yeah, a lot of that has to do with, with respect. And now that, that comes through when it comes to the projects. Now it comes to the workers. 
So from a worker standpoint, we really just need to get keep getting the message out. We have a lot of people that um, indigenous and non-indigenous that that don't know that a lot of their traits that they did in oil and gas or else other industries are very comparable and just pay just as well. And, and I should say even more so, they're very much, much more sustainable careers than in the oil and gas. And I think that's very important. I think we need to get the education and the message out. And, and I mean, I can say from my community, which I can't even say the name of my own community properly. So that's what you, you did fine. Thank you. Um, I usually go by the, the colonist name of Whitefish Bay, which I like to fish. So, uh, but I can say in our band office and a lot of band offices throughout Treaty 3, my region, we do see the job postings and I can say those are very impactful. So the manager just make sure that that line of communication is consistent and regular and make sure that we are always getting out these, these job opportunities that are, that are there. And I, sometimes I'm seeing jobs being posted by other indigenous communities from out west in Ontario. And I can say that, that is, that's important. Don't think that, that just because we are 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 kilometers away, that people are from, from my res aren't interested in going. A lot of times we are. You know, we just don't know about it and we don't know that our skills are transferable. So uh, without us hogging up all the time, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. Leticia, anything to add? Those were really great comments, Keegan. Um, there's a lot to take away from that. Um, I would say uh, when it comes to Indigenous-led climate solutions, uh, really they encourage us to take a second look at our own understanding. Um, and when I say our own, I mean uh, typical westernized views of, of business and operations. But take a look at our understanding of responsibility, accountability, ownership, and things like that. Indigenous worldviews can share a perspective that we are responsible for the stewardship of the land, not just to shareholders. We're accountable for the impacts of our decisions on the generations after the, us. And what is meant by convention, conventional Western world ownership is not the right to act with autonomy and authority, but rather a responsibility to the collective, to all rights holders. Um, to the employees of the organization and to the community that we're operating within and, and the stewardship that goes along with that. So that is all to say that some of the ways that we can best support Indigenous workers is by recognizing that perspectives can be different and welcoming those perspectives and the value that they bring. Uh, welcoming alternative ways of, ways of working, such as seasonal flexibility. That was an initiative that I heard of uh, from Pembina. Um, also indigenous or initiatives that support the building of community and mentorship, such as you have on the Iron and Earth platform, those are incredibly valuable, recognizing the value of community to different cultures and how much it means. So I'll pass it back to you, Emmanuel. Thank you, that was fantastic. Uh, and before I roll it out to the rest of the, uh, the panel, uh, Desmond, could you um, add a bit to this? How can we best support indigenous workers, Desmond? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'd be honored to answer this question. Please. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the first uh, barriers I actually see and one of the biggest issues I actually do see is there is no um, cultural sensitivity training or orientation programs that happen in industry, education, or the government. Um, how can you learn about First Nations people when we're all painted with the same brush? I myself am Cree. Uh, my neighbors are down south, are Blood and, and Kainai. Up north, I have the Métis and the Inuit. We're all uh, Indigenous, but we are not all First Nations people of this country, and we're all diverse in regards to our language, culture, protocol, and understanding. So I think a good start would be there, you know, create some sort of orientation, cultural sensitivity within the industry, within governance, within uh, education, so people are aware of what First Nations people are and the Indigenous people are of their area. You know, um, they, we talk about truth and reconciliation and how this is supposed to work toward that goal and being achieved, but I don't see any action being done. I see more action being done at Iron and Earth in regards to creating cultural programs in their in their in what we're doing right now than the government is doing themselves. So for me, I think that's a good start right there. You know, create that awareness, create that understanding, you know, bring the people that understanding of knowing that First Nations people are here and they're still there, their culture is still there, their history is still there. But until you actually showcase that in regards to who we are and what we are, basically you're just banging on a door, checking off something on a checklist in regards to a consultation process. So for me, you know, that goes so much further in regards to making sure this is the first step where we start. 
making sure we have people that are aware when they actually approach First Nations people and how to approach with them. So when I go ahead and do a consultant consultation, they know and understand the protocol practice. They understand the history, the culture, the people, and why consultation is important to them. Also, manpower and uh, machinery are actually very important in First Nation communities. We have a lot of them. We have a lot of machinery. We have a lot of manpower, but it's never accessible. We're never actually there in regards to project development. We're there in regards to make sure that check mark is clicked off in regards to consultation, but we're not really invited. So I think that needs to change the dynamics. If someone's going to be doing development in regards to a First Nation community, invite that First Nation community out to actually have the opportunity to be employed, to actually create that capacity development and training. Another thing also is, you know, you know, the portal is great. You know, why don't we uh, work with the portal in regards to uh, creating that partnership with First Nation human resource departments? You know, they have a vast resource of human resources of background people and education training in regards to every industry, but we just don't have that portal or access to actually get our people out there. Another thing also, you know, I, I love renewable energy. I love training my members. I love getting to work. But at the end of the day, when the project was over, there was nothing there to continue for them to be working on. There was no maintenance or upkeep of how to keep these, pro, uh, these systems running, how to ensure that they're running at full capacity. There was nothing really there in regards to cater to, to ensure that they, you know, grew that excitement of being in this industry, but wanted to continue being in this industry. So for me, this goes a long way. And I think, uh, I don't know if it was uh, uh, Leticia. Leticia. Who said, yeah, who said it earlier in regards to the treaties. You know, the treaties are in place. The treaties are actually hold a big respect of uh, taking care of uh, the land, the resources, and taking care of future generations. That is a huge component of the treaties. And I think if we embrace that all as a uh, treaty people and Canadian citizens, then I think that goes so much further in creating that conversation. Because at the end of the day, I actually believe this. You know, We are all treaty people. We are all treaty Canadian citizens. And the more um, people that Canadian citizens are like embrace the treaties and understand they belong part of this treaty. They can embrace the aspects of these treaties. You will not only change your idealism of being a Canadian, but you trade your. You also get. Uh, you also garner that uh, the idealism of being a, a treaty citizen. Also, so there's so much that can be done. But I think uh, first and foremost, we need to start working on that cultural sensitivity and cultural training orientation process. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Desmond, short of saying "Wow," I don't know what else to say. <laughs> can I add to that if I could? Manuel? You know what? I was just going to ask if anybody else wanted to add anything to it. By all means, go right ahead, Keegan. Well, I want to say, Miigwech, Chief, um, you, you, you really uh, you made me think about something else, and that's, that was the TRC. I mean, we've, we, we've heard a lot of hoopla about the TRC in the past, but have you heard anything over the last couple of years? Nothing. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, there was a lot of talk about how great this was and how much Canada is going to change as a result. But what has the government done since? I think, I, think, I mean, don't want to blame anything on the pandemic, but it just seems like it's kind of fallen off. You know, we've, we've, we keep finding graves of our children across the Canada, but you don't hear about that anymore. But I mean, you don't hear about everything that the government has promised that they would do to help and support and make things right. But re reconciliation without action is just words, so. Thanks, Keegan. Uh, does anybody have any other final thoughts on this question? No? Okay, so uh, final question, I'm gonna ask directly to uh, Keegan and Tamara, and then I'll roll it out to the rest of the group as well. Um, Keegan, what gives you hope that we'll be successful in pushing forward to a just transition? What gives you hope? Well, you know, I think as an indigenous person and, and just being the son of my mother, I've always been a hopeful person. I mean, I you can ask anyone that knows me, I am the eternal optimist. But beyond that, the winds of change are here. I really believe that what we're seeing with what's going on in the world and not just the pandemic and, and crisis overseas right now, but I mean, you're seeing industry recognized. Um, being a banker, working in finance myself, you're really seeing this, this wave of socially responsible investing and not just because it feels good, but because it's the right thing to do and it's profitable. So now you're seeing all these metrics that are being put in place from the financial and banking industry to say, if you're not hitting all these different check marks, you're gonna be scored ac accordingly based upon how socially responsible you are, how, how effective is your board, 
I mean, even things that'll say like executive compensation. Are you are you making millions of dollars when your company has not been profitable? I mean, how what kind of environmental impact does your does your operation have? All these things are now things that get scored from the investment world. So I believe that as indigenous people and even non-indigenous, you know, these are things, you know, the, the transition has to happen. Thank you. Um, but also it makes, it, it makes financial sense. I mean, you cannot compare building a, a brand new coal or gas plant against the, the economics of solar right now. It just, you just can't. You, someone tries to build a brand new gas plant, it, you're never going to get the return if by building an equi equivalent uh, solar plant with storage. So, I mean, it's just the timing is now. So, thank you. Tamara, your time to be optimistic. What gives you hope? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I'm not hopeful, I'll be honest. Like this week when temperatures hit 40 degrees above normal in the Arctic, but in general, I'm hopeful because I'm looking. I'm looking around the world and I have a big picture view through my research on what different places are doing and including here in Canada and in Canada I'm hopeful and I'm really hopeful with Indigenous economic development because we have diverse First Nations across Canada that are economic powerhouses and are showing how you can lead the way in many respects with um, with energy sustainable energy development. It's like it's a lot of investment it's amazing and it's inspiring. And I, I would like to say that as much as you, um, um, Keegan and, and Chief uh, Desmond have pointed out many of the deficiencies and Leticia as well, we're finally talking about the strength of indigenous economies. And we're like, it, it, there's so much happening. There's, there's a lot to be hopeful for in that respect, I'd say. I'm hopeful too, because I look around um, at different countries and I find hopeful things. Um, lately, I've been studying the just transition in Scotland they are seeing a huge shift to wind energy investments. They have a just transition commission. They've had huge um, you know, nationwide conversations about what needs to happen and industries on board with that. I've been studying New Zealand where there is a real commitment to a very firm commitment to have no more offshore oil and gas exploration and a very firm commitment to make sure that Maori economic development is absolutely prioritized within that transition process. And I've been looking at Denmark where a transition has been happening for a really long time, where they've seen colossal investments in wind energy and they're not doing any more oil and gas exploration, not for an environmental imperative, even much so much as an economic one that drove that choice. They've seen over the last several decades, 400% increase in wind energy. So there's all of these hopeful signals and, and I'm really starting to see different places have a vision of this new economy be born out and fruitful and with good jobs and much more sustainable in terms of the ups and downs too. And that is all rather hopeful. And you're all making me hopeful today too. Um, this portal is great and the type of work you're doing is great. That is fantastic. Thank you so very, very much. Now, does anybody else have any other comments that would suggest that there's reason for hope? Leticia, Paul, anyone else? Great here, Emmanuel. Uh, yes, please. Um, you know, well, mine not really so much uh, hope and optimism. I think it's more or less a, a harsh reality. Uh, you know, the reality is, you know, we as a species and we as human beings, we're, we're, we're at a tipping point here in regards to where we need to be. And the survival of us as a species, you know, has to be projected in regards to that sustainability, you know, embracing the green technology, you know, looking at ways of being more energy efficient, uh, you know, uh, addressing other issues besides uh, social and uh, economical issues. You know, I think uh, population itself is something that needs to be addressed. You know, I think... Um, for me, I always believe, you know, capitalism without uh, an environmental conscience is uh, destroying this planet. And it, it's very true. So until actually uh, they look at a way of, uh, you know, creating a revenue, but being conscious about uh, Mother, Earth, Mother Earth and environment and being a stewardship in regards to the project development uh, goes so much further in regards to ensuring that uh, human beings that as a whole have the opportunity to create that survival, but also uh, be responsible in, in the work they're doing. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see more uh, re reclamation and remediation and project development. I want to see a lot of that more be a part of the, that project in regards to seeing it to come to fruition, seeing it to be done and seeing it uh, winding down. You know, it, it, it's it's written within the treaty there that uh, how this should be done, uh, you know, but uh, where, where we live is uh, 
is some, we have this agreement in place, a treaty that actually outlines this work. And this treaty was written over a hundred years ago. I mean, they foreseen this type of thing that needs to happen, this type of action that needs to happen. So I really think, you know, maybe look internally at that. You want to find answers. They're right there. They're written black and white. Uh, they're written over a hundred years ago. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's a good start there in regards to developing that partnership within Canada. But um, that gives me hope, you know, because a lot of people are realizing Nobody wants to pay for gas to drive their vehicle. You know, the price of gas is skyrocketing. Uh, last month alone, $500 on electric bill. You know, if I can get a wind turbine and some, some solar in my, in my house, I'd love to do that. You know, it, it, and in turn, you know, and the end of the day, nobody wants to work for a paycheck to pay a utility bill. You know, and I think that's what people want to realize. And that's the hope they want to reach. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Desmond. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, this has been an amazing discussion. I'd like to bring in, or at least reintroduce, Sally and Rohan, uh, who will be taking over the Q&A. Uh, Sally and Rohan, the floor is now yours. Happy to be back. Glad to have you back. Cool. Um, so we had a few questions come in. Uh, I wonder, Rohan, would you like to take the first one? For sure. So I think, that, so yeah, one of the questions we had was, will the portal have qualities similar to platforms like Indeed? Will I be able to make an account that holds my training and qualifications for employers to see? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, especially in terms of thinking about what the similarity to Indeed is. So we we really don't see ourselves as like a competitor to or a replacement to Indeed. Um, rather something, a tool that can be used alongside Indeed. So, I mean, in, on Indeed, you can obviously save jobs. You can like post, build a, a profile of your training programs and, and what you've done and employers can see that. Right now, we let you like browse training programs, um, but they, you don't, you can't at the moment, like put a training program on your profile that's something we'll probably release as more people start using it. We want to be able to send, you know, worker profiles to companies and like have you actually, you know, designate which training programs you you've completed and so forth. So that's definitely uh, a future feature. And then I think the other point in terms of that I want to make is we're really viewing this as like a hub and spoke model. So the climate career portal being the the hub and the way we really improve this platform over time is by partnering with different kinds of agencies that are specialized like the Canadian Wind Energy uh, Association like Efficiency Canada actually partnering with organizations that have specialized data specialized contacts uh, for each climate solution and and working in partnership with them to improve the quality of content on the site and and we hope to do this continuously. Uh, and, and I think now is also, you know, a good time to, to shout out some of the developers that uh, actually brought this whole career portal to life. So Leo Rabinovich was uh, our lead front end developer who built, you know, the majority of the content or the components on the site. Uh, uh, Alex Flint, uh, he was our back end developer and he has, you know, worked all the magic in terms of implementing you know, some of the algorithms that, that we have on the back end. And then now we have Don Pasaliao, who's also a front end developer and, and has been helping us get the uh, to the next step here. So yeah, I think the future is really exciting um, in terms of the sky's the limit in terms of the kind of features that we want to implement. And and really it's going to be up to, up to, you know, the users, the people who are using this, like you should tell us what to build and and we'll we'll go build it. Um, the current version is is what is like, the simplest thing in terms of what we um, heard from folks and, and we want to make it more advanced in terms of, you know, delivering the, the most useful functionality we can. Um, yeah, so I think that was, I think we got a bunch more questions, Sally. Definitely do. Thanks, Rohan. Um, and we have a few questions for the panelists too, actually tons, um, but since we have a limited amount of time, we'll just go for a couple. Uh, from Rohan and I, uh, and, and one for the panel as well. Um, we have a question about how many jobs are on the portal. Uh, so for, for us to launch with, we currently have over 600 jobs from over 30 different companies, but we are always adding more. So if 
your company wants your jobs hosted, you can shoot us an email at ccp at ironandearth.org. We'll have a final slide with that email up. Or when you visit the Climate Career Portal on the jobs board, you can directly click Add Jobs and there's a survey form where you can input the information. Um, really anyone can post a job to the portal. We just review them to make sure it's got all the information. So cool. We have a, another question from the audience and this time it's open to the whole panel. So climate change is a global challenge without borders. And so we should lean on the experience of other regions and nations. Tamara has mentioned universal political commitment in Denmark to phased managed transition. Does the panel see other examples in other communities or throughout the rest of the world that we might follow? Sure. Hey. Anyone can jump in. Yeah. I'll, uh, considering I'm working currently in Cambodia and, and it was in the South Pacific before that, you know, I, I, I think that it, around the world you're seeing the, it's just the absolute need. Now, Cambodia versus Samoa, two totally different entities. Samoa being a couple of independent island nations, it's much easier for them to do a pivot uh, and pull themselves off of renewables, or I mean, pull themselves transition to renewables. Uh, and it's, you know, they just, it, it's easier for them to do that, easier for them to get it funded versus you're looking at a, a massive country like Cambodia, while it's nothing like Canada, United States, uh, and they are still a developing nation, they, they're in an interesting position where you know, they, they're very dirty right now because they, they're operating, you know, 50, 60 years old behind the rest of the world. So they, they, they want to go clean. They want to go tech. They want to be cool. But they are dealing with similar issues that we are, that we put down at the grassroots level of communities here in Canada is getting people to believe in them and invest the money. Um, and then obviously throw in the, the, the current couple of years of delays and ability to travel. I mean, that throws things in, but now I'm seeing a lot of resurgence in, in this coming back. So, um, you know, and the other example is some people may have heard of the Great Reset. Um, and, and that is somewhat controversial, but uh, it's, it's, it's a mentality that's been sweeping this thing. Let's use this, these past two years of when people have pretty much paused life as what better time than to advance and reset, push that reset button on how we've been doing things. And is that gonna work? I don't know, but I think I, I like the idea and we, there seems to have enough backing from a lot of powerful people and, and governments to, to say, let's do that. So that's my point. Thanks, Keegan. I, I might chime in too. Those are great examples, Keegan. And I might chime in that uh, I think there's so much comparative policy learning and leading practices that we can look at. In Canada, in general, we have quite low compared to other advanced economies, private sector investment in innovation. That's a problem for us. And our productivity has largely been driven by lower labor um, you know, costs in general. So we have a lot of catching up to do with investments in Canada. And there are some major initiatives, for instance, in the European Union, they have the Just Transition Mechanism, which is pushing $150 billion through various um, three major um, programs to manage a just transition process, including regional development funds. And regional development, we don't talk about this enough in Canada, but a lot of our transitions are place-based transitions and that we could be much more effective with how we use uh, regional development and innovation policy in Canada. So those are just some um, examples that I find inspiring. Anyone else with anything to jump in with? Well, we can sit on it and think for, for a minute and we can always come back to this. Um, we have another question. So someone wrote, after 25 years in oil and gas and normal opportunities, I took courses and I'm now a certified energy manager. Congratulations. I'm now seeking a new career in the field of lithium. Any career advice or job opportunities? Uh, maybe I can give it a go first. So thanks for this question. And yeah, lithium plays such a big role in batteries. It's being used in 
anything that has a battery and particularly electrical vehicles also. Um, and so in that sense, the platform is certainly a starting point. Uh, you can get into the world of EV charging, um, which is connected um, loosely to lithium. Um, and so you can use it to prepare and compare different transition pathways, uh, get access to more information around EV charging, um, but it definitely speaks to our need to add more climate solutions uh, and also more granular information about related uh, sectors as well. Rohan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think maybe one thing I would also say in, in terms of the career advice component of that question, um, you know, one thing, one thing that we plan on, on implementing is a mentorship office hours. So we'll have people, we haven't really figured out exactly how we're going to select these individuals, but there are going to be people who are, uh, you know, in industry or, or have, who, who've already worked or who are actively working in, in some of the climate solutions we're focused on, but enabling you to, to book time with, with any of them and, 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 um, you know, get your questions answered and so forth. And, and we also might have a, a longer term kind of mentorship program that you can sign up for as well. So hopefully that answers the career advice component of, of the question. Uh, and then, yeah, as Sally mentioned, in terms of job opportunities, we're gonna, we have EV charging as a climate solution. So you can expect you know, more training uh, projects and jobs to be, to be added relating, relating to that climate solution too. Thanks, Rohan. Um, ooh, another question for the panel. All right. What support did you receive during your career that helped you get to where you are today? So reflecting a little bit on your personal experiences. I guess I could speak on this a little bit. Um, I had an astounding um, support from my family and friends um, that I was just taking a positive initiative to transition to a career that's making a change in the world. Um, and since then, I've just, uh, even speaking here today, has just reinvigorated my passion for this industry and uh, making a positive change. I guess I'll take, I'll, I'll start next and thanks, Paul. Um, really just getting back up. I mean, the amount of times that I've tripped or fallen over and failed, um, just the ability to keep on moving, um, but also the ability to have vision uh, and seeing, seeing things that matter the most to me. And for me, some of the biggest priorities, uh, things that make me happy are you know, making others happy. So, and a lot of times that isn't easy, like that can be very demanding and mentally draining, but you know, it's about balance too, right? So make sure you take time to, to recharge your batteries um, in the sun. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, just keep moving. Um, for, and, but be flexible. I mean, looking back at 17 year old me, do I, would I think I've been anywhere where I am right now? No, I thought I was gonna go into real estate and be a millionaire, I'm far from being a millionaire right now, but I'm happy, so. Just keep moving. Can I um, also add, um, you know, I think uh, for me, my journey uh, brought, brought the, my journey started about seven years ago. Uh, when I first uh, got into leadership, I was trying to find ways of uh, trying to contribute to my community. Um, you know, um, then a uh, solar training program came up. Uh, I went and took the solar training program. My Kudema from Greenpeace was there also. Uh, he invited me to meet with a few groups. I uh, was able to get me into a, a walrus talks at the, uh, Royal Alberta Museum, where uh, Shannon Phillips, uh, the uh, NDP at the time, was um, uh, recruiting for a uh, energy efficiency and advisory panel. So uh, she invited me to sit on there. Um, from there, it uh, opened up opportunity for me to work with a various number of groups, organizations across this country and the province. Uh, you know, including also Solar Alberta, Energy Efficiency Alberta, Green Energy Network. Um, you know, there's uh, so many. Uh, organizations was able to contribute but for me um 
it was that networking that really helped. It was that networking and ability to know that if I didn't know anything, that I was able to reach out to somebody who was an expert in regards to answering those questions that I had. That way I didn't have to stumble around. I didn't have to look at uh, creating some sort of program. I just looked at best practices, you know, uh, best, uh, uh, best ways of, of doing things and then following those and, and getting questions and feedback. Um, so for me, uh, I was very fortunate to, to create something that wasn't there in regards to a network uh, of First Nations that works with uh, in, uh, industry that works with government that works with uh <clears throat> that works with education um so much so i even formed a company called uh, uh summit indigenous ventures which does consultation mainly on capacity development bringing cultural awareness but working toward the energy sector and, and showcasing the energy sector um i even transitioned transitioned over to uh part of my job as chief i actually work for the green party of alberta as an indigenous relations critic so i really do get myself involved but at the end of the day it's that networking and that ability to know that I, if I have uh, questions and I need answers to those questions, then I can reach out to those people within those networks and I can get that feedback. So I'm very honored and very, uh, uh, you know, very fortunate to actually have that, that ability to actually do that and create that network. And I think that goes so much further in regards to how you want a support program in place. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um... And thank you so much, actually, as a whole, to all of our fantastic panelists. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to listen to all of you speak. A lot of learning, for sure, for all of us also. Um, I want to say sorry to our audience that we can't get to all of the questions, um, but the email ccp at ironandearth.org is definitely open for questions, comments, feedback, any thoughts that you want to share with us. Feel free to also drop them to Q&A chat. Also, we're making sure that we keep a record of these um, and it definitely will inform what we do moving forward. So big, big thank you again to our amazing panelists. And I want to actually hand it back to our moderator, Emmanuel. <laughs> um, I've already said what I wanted to say, which is wow. And thank you. You have all been so incredibly generous with your time, with your knowledge, with your insight and hoping that you know we'll be able to sort of reach out to you as we continue to expand this platform and grow this this particular process um i i can't thank you enough and because if i tried i will still fall short so thank you very very much and i'll turn it back now to louisa thank you kindly emmanuel so sadly we have actually reached the end of our event and Thank you to everyone who attended, who participated today. Thank you so much for your fabulous questions. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. And a big, big thank you to everybody who made the Climate Career Portal a reality. The portal will evolve through user feedback, so we welcome all of your suggestions. As a former fossil fuel worker myself, I'm passionate about empowering workers to have the knowledge and understanding of how workers can transition to net zero because it is fossil fuel workers who will build the energy economy of the future. We invite you all to check out the Climate Career Portal. The link to the portal will be posted in the chat. We welcome your feedback and the link to the feedback will also be posted into the chat. The Climate Career Portal is there for all workers to create their path to the net zero economy. And let's help empower workers across Canada. Have a great night, everybody, and thank you so much for joining. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely night. Thank you. Goodbye.